Hi. Welcome back to Quantitative Analysis and Anthropology. I'm Professor Peregrin, and today we are on Topic 8, Lesson 1. We'll be talking about ANOVA, which is an acronym for Analysis of Variance. Okay. Before we start, I want to talk about a couple of things. First, the approach I'm going to be taking to ANOVA. I'm going to be talking about ANOVA in terms of t-test and z-test, and essentially I want you to think about ANOVA conceptually as a t-test where you have more than two groups. If you have two groups, you have a t-test. If you have more than two groups that you're comparing, then you have an ANOVA. And in fact, the results of an ANOVA and a t-test, if you only have two groups, are going to be essentially the same. There's another way to look at ANOVA, and that is mathematically, because ANOVA really falls into what's called the general linear model, which is regression. Because what you're looking at in ANOVA is variance. And if you think about the, a regression, you're looking for the least squared regression line. You're looking at variance, and you're trying to minimize variance. So you're analyzing variance. And mathematically, ANOVA is more, falls into the general linear model uh, and in, instead of the t-test uh, format. But in the end, what you're doing is, is looking at a value called the F value, which is a ratio of essentially differences of means under or divided by uh, standard, standard deviation of variance. And that's very much like the t-test and the z-test. So I think conceptually, thinking about this as an expansion of the t-test is the best way for you to come to understand it. And it works well visually, too. And again, I'm trying to teach this course conceptually and visually, not mathematically. The reason I say this is, in your text, or in uh, videos you might watch online, or other exercises, you might see ANOVA discussed in terms of the general linear model, and mathematically, that's accurate. I'm taking a different approach to help you understand this more conceptually, okay? So, let's start with analysis of variance. And we're going to begin with this man, R.A. Fisher, one of the great minds of the 20th century, and arguably one of the most important mathematicians and geneticists uh, who has ever lived. Fisher was, again, chair of eugenics at University College London. And remember, who else? had this, Carl Pearson, who did the Pearson correlation coefficient. And that position was created by Galton. So we have these roots in statistics that deal with eugenics and essentially with physical anthropology. And we go back again, this is that race theory that was competing with a cultural theory of how to explain variation in behavior. Uh, Fisher was the last chair of eugenics, um, and that became a, a genetics chair, and I think you'll understand why. But anyway, he was a strong proponent of race theory throughout his career. And really, the chair of eugenics and eugenics as a whole um, stopped being part of the mainstream after World War II. Um, you know that, I, I assume that the Nazis were great proponents of eugenics, and part of the Nazi agenda was to breed an Aryan race that was superior to others. After the Nazis were defeated, that idea of breeding a race um, was seen to be what it is, which is highly discriminatory and dangerous. Uh, but Fisher maintained that 
idea that we should be trying to do that and was a strong proponent of race theory throughout his life. He also made perhaps the most important contribution to evolution of anyone, at least in the 20th century, and that was with a book called The Genetical Theory of Natural Selection. In The Genetical Theory of Natural Selection, Fisher brings together genetics and evolution. We think of those two going together all the time, right? That evolution is based on changes in DNA, uh, changes in gene frequency over time. Until Fisher, that idea was never formalized in a way that, that brought the two together. In some ways, he was like the, the Newton or the Einstein of genetics. Interestingly, the last segment, the last part of the genetical theory of natural selection is all about eugenics. So it sort of brings it full circle, I think, that statistics and physical anthropology develop together focusing on this issue of race. So a statistics course in anthropology is really a history of anthropology, at least until about 1930. Okay. Analysis of variance. Here are three different distributions of happy me. You'll notice that they are quite a bit different looking, but if we look carefully at this, all of them have exactly the same mean. The mean of all three is exactly the same. What we're seeing that makes them look so different is that they each have different variances. And in the t-test and the z-test, we've been looking at means. Here we're going to change that, and instead of just looking at means, we're going to look at variances. And if you think about this again conceptually, if two samples are drawn from the same population, they should have not only the same mean, but the same variance. So we could have populations or, or samples drawn from two different populations that have the same mean, but if we look at their variances, they're very different. That's what analysis of variance does. Instead of just looking at means, it looks at mean and variance together. And variance becomes the key part, the core part of analysis of variance, right? That's the name, analysis of variance because of, of this very clear difference. You can have samples with the same mean but very different uh, variances or with very similar means but very different variances and they, if they have those very different variances they can't have been drawn from the same population, at least not by random sampling. Okay. ANOVA, the results come out of what's called an F-test. So we have T-test. For ANOVA, we have an F-test. If you remember, a T-test looks at differences between two groups based on a, a created, a mathematically created distribution. I didn't talk about this in the lesson because in teaching this for many years, I found it is confusing. But in fact, if we look at that artificial distribution, that's created. It essentially is a distribution of differences of means divided by a calculated standard error. It's based on differences of means from samples from those distributions of means. So you can see how that can become confusing. But essentially, it's, it's just like a z-test or like we talk about the t-test where we're comparing means divided by a standard deviation. And the F-test is very much like that, in, not cal in terms of its calculation, not in terms of its math, but in the end of what it is. It looks at the variance between groups as a ratio with the variance within groups. All right. We'll, We'll look at those in a minute, but if we go back to this, 
Here's the variance between groups. The variance within groups is going to be essentially nothing here because that we're looking at means. But here the variance within groups is great. And if we have a small number and a big number, then we're going to have a small number. If we have, I mean, a, a big number. <laughs> and that's what F is looking at. So we're going to have between group variance as a ratio of within group variance. So let's take a look at that. That's the F test. And again, conceptually, this is kind of like a T test or a Z test. So here are those three groups now laid out against one another. And let's say this is what we actually get with these are the means. The differences between those means as a sum of square differences is going to be the between group variance. The within group variance is looking essentially at the standard deviation. That's how you can think of that. So we're looking at a ratio of how much these differ in terms of their means versus how much they differ in terms of their variance. And again, think of this. This can be like difference between means divided by a variance, which is a t-test or a z-test. So f equals a ratio of between group variance by within group variance. Differences between the means versus a standard deviation is essentially the same kind of of thing we're looking at. We call this F because the distribution is different than a normal distribution. If you remember with the t-test, degrees of freedom change the amount of the, the number of cases that could be in the tail, the probability of cases being in the tail. The F distribution is completely different. It has a shape like a, a, a right skewed or a positively skewed normal distribution and that skewness changes depending on the degrees of freedom and so how many um, cases are in the tail. So this again like the t-test is dependent on degrees of freedom because the distribution changes depending on those degrees of freedom. Okay, we're going to take a short break. There's a lot of material. You can go back through it and look at it again. Think about it. Read your text. Come back and look at an example. We'll see you in a few minutes. And we are back. So we're going to start with an example now of ANOVA. And we are, yes, again, using Boaz's immigrant study. Uh, I keep going back to this because it is really important in the history of anthropology, and the data are great for talking about this stuff. And, and it is the focus of where a lot of the statistics we use come out of, that question does race explain variation in human behavior or does culture? All right. So, in race theory, we would hypothesize that race and behavior are causally linked. Right? So, our, our research hypothesis, if we are looking at variation, we would say that racial characteristics differ between identified cultures, right? Because culture and race are causally linked. The null hypothesis we would have there is that racial characteristics are the same between various cultures or that they're randomly distributed among various cultures. So the test model we would use to look at that, at least given Boaz's data, is that this, we're going to use the cephalic index. We talked about this. This is how round the head is. And again, this was thought to be related to intelligence and behavior. Um, the, the cephalic index is going to be dependent upon culture, or race, sorry. 
the cephalic index is dependent upon race, which is our independent variable. Our null hypothesis then is that the cephalic index will be the same between races. It's kind of different than the t-test we looked at last time because we were looking at immigrants and uh, foreign-born to look at whether the effect of culture. Here we're just looking at race. So the null hypothesis would be the cephalic index will be the same between races. Remember, the null hypothesis is the opposite of the research hypothesis, which would be that the cephalic index differs. That goes back to the theory. That's what we would expect based on race theory. All right. These are the races the BOAS looked at, coded data for, in terms of the cephalic index. And we look at these and we might say, well, these are not races. These are nationalities or ethnicities. Exactly. Today, we see these as ethnicities. Under race theory, because these are different cultures, different eth ethnicities, these are racial groups, right? Because variation in behavior is based on race. So, these are all different races, not different cultures. So, Bohemian, Hebrew, Hungarian, and Slovak, and Polish are all kind of Eastern, Central European groups. Bohemian is essentially German. You can think of it that way. Uh, and most Jewish groups are in Central and Eastern Europe. Central Italian and Sicilian are both sort of Italian peninsula, and then Scotch is Northern British Isles. So we have sort of all of Europe covered, but it's sort of biased to Central and Eastern Europe. But yeah, these don't seem like racial groups, do they? If you look back at old literature, though, these are very much the kinds of groups that are discussed in terms of races, again, because we see these as different cultures, particularly Hebrew, because it has a very different language, different clothes, different um, activities, different prohibitions and what people can do. So Hebrews or Jews were seen as a race. Of course, under the Nazis, they were a race to be eliminated. Um, but, but all of these are seen as races under race theory, which is difficult for us to think of today because they aren't races, right? They're cultures. This is what they look like in terms of the cephalic index. So this is a box plot. If, uh, if you'll remember, we have the 50th percentiles, the median, and then the whole range of the distribution. And you can think of these, if you'll remember, as like a distribution that's been tipped on its edge. So we're seeing that normal curve would be maybe like that, tipped up on its edge and we're looking at it from the top. If we look at these, the 50th percentiles here are all very similar and the medians, and remember that in a normal distribution, and all of these are pretty normal, that in a normal distribution the mean and the median are the same. So we can think of these here as means here it's pulled off a little bit from the 50th percentile, so that would mean that this is a little bit skewed, and we can see there are some outliers. Um, but we can think of these as means. So if we look at the means, the ratio between the mean and the standard deviation is going to be about the same, which means an F will be about zero, or it will be low. You might notice, though, that there are two groups that are outlined, that the 50th percentile for Scotch and to some extent for Sicilian are not overlapping with the other groups and their means, here the median again, but mean and median in a, in a normal distribution are the same. Their medians don't overlap with the rest. That's what you will see in an ANOVA as as creating a statistically significant difference. 
we could do this as a t-test comparing these groups and those groups and if we did that as an ANOVA it would essentially be a t-test we have two groups an ANOVA and a t-test are essentially the same thing what ANOVA allows us to do is compare multiple groups in the same sort of framework as a t-test I will say one thing you can kind of see this how it, how the linear model might work because we could see if there's some kind of linear pattern among the groups rather than just a random pattern um, but again I like thinking about this in terms of distributions uh, of normal distributions and how they overlap or don't so just looking at this these are going to be interesting because they're so different that they are going to potentially make the ANOVA be statistically significant. So let's look at that. So again, the F test is the ratio of variance between, variance within. The variance between groups is 1828. Variance within is 11.8, so our F value is 155.4. Now, you're never going to calculate these. You're always going to get them out of the computer. And in fact, you probably will never pay much attention to these. You're going to just pay attention to the number. We are way beyond the point of where we are going to calculate these ourselves. So when we look at F, we're really just looking at the value of F. We're not going to worry about that other than conceptually just to, to recognize it's a ratio of variances between and within groups. To find out the statistically significant alpha, the critical value, we use a table just like we did with z-scores, just like we did with the t-test, and just like the t-test we need both degrees of freedom and from that we can find out what the value is. So here we have the degrees of freedom of the denominator and the degrees of freedom of the numerator and that's how an F table works. So what we have here is degrees of freedom of six and if you remember there are seven races so the degrees of freedom are always n minus one. So we have six and then the Degrees of freedom for within is a calculated number um, that, that we're not going to go into, but in this case it's 4727. Essentially infinity. It's so large. So we have infinity here, and we have six here. We bring those together, bring those together, and we get 2.10. If we get an F, that is larger than 2.10, we reject the null hypothesis. That's the critical value. Do we have an F that is bigger than 2.10? Yeah, it's a little bigger, isn't it? So, F is greater than alpha, so we reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so one way to interpret an analysis of variance then is to look visually and again I'm trying to provide a way to think about this conceptually and visually is we look at that box plot again and what we can see is that what's pulling off the the cases or the samples is this which is scotch and Sicilian those are the ones that are really creating the variance both between and within groups that creates this large F. And it might not look like these are that different, but particularly Scotch, they really are different. And if you have a group that's that different, it's going to make the ANOVA statistically significant. And also remember that power matters, t-tests, in ANOVA power matters also, and we have a lot of cases here. So there's a lot of power here, and so these two are going to, uh, with this kind of difference, are going to make for a very large F value, which this is. It's almost ridiculously large at 155. Um, another way that we can look at 
uh, the results of an ANOVA is that we can look at the means. And so here is a table of the means. And if you remember from uh, last time we were looking at means of the foreign born and US born, that it was about, foreign born was about 83. And you can see that here, we got 85, 83, 83, 85, 84, and then 80, 78 and 80. So these two really are different if you look at it in terms of means. And that's what ANOVA is showing you. And we can see also the variance. And the variance here is real low. And so that variance being low says, oh, that mean is, is pretty clear and that those then are, are really quite different. So this is how we interpret an ANOVA is we, we look at the groups where the, where the means and the variance differ a lot. Now in this particular case, the main differences are coming out of these means because the variances are relatively similar, although these kind of variances are not usually a very large number. And so when we've got between 3.5 and 3.1, even though that's only 4 tenths, uh, that that's, uh, can be pretty dramatic. All right. So that's ANOVA. Again, I want to emphasize that ANOVA is very much like a t-test but you can use it when there are multiple groups. For anthropology, that's really useful because we can use ANOVA to look at, for example, a number of different cultures on some variable of interest. We can look at a group of different subpopulations within a larger population, a group of ethnic groups or ethnicities within a larger population. Um, looking across groups like uh, grade school, middle school, high school, college, things like that, across um, groups based on income or education. And so it's a really useful technique uh, for anthropology. And if you think about it, it's one of the reasons it's useful is because it only relies on one variable being interval. The grouping variable the independent variable, which creates those groups, can be nominal. And this will still work. And again, in anthropology, we often don't have interval data, so we're limited in the kinds of statistics we can do. In the next topic, we're going to move directly into that problem that we're limited in the statistics that we can do. We're, we're done with all of the statistics now that require interval data. And in the next two topics, we're going to be looking at statistics that we can use with nominal and ordinal data, which is mostly what we have. So we're through a big chunk of the course. I hope at this point you have a really good understanding of those interval or what are called parametric statistics because with interval data we can establish parameters like means and standard deviations. We can't do that with nominal or ordinal data and so we're going to move on to statistics that we can use with those non-parametric data and we'll see you next time.